Welcome back folks and if you're new here welcome my name is Danae and I am an organic gardener and herbalist here in the beautiful state of Maine and today I'm going to be sharing with you my 2024 garden plan. We'll talk a little bit about what we did last year, what we're anticipating doing this year, and I'll also share where I get my seeds and what I do to make gardening fun and hopefully not too much work. So if you're looking for time and money saving tips and tricks for growing your own vegetable and medicinal garden, please watch this video. I think you're gonna find a lot of this information very helpful. So I've been gardening for about four years now and last year we expanded our garden. I wanna say it's about 10 times larger than it was previous years. So there was a monumental effort we put in in the previous growing season. We now have large sections for culinary herbs, medicinal herbs. We've got a lot of raised beds that we're using for our vegetable garden, as well as a few plots for growing shell beans, barley, buckwheat, and a few other cover crops. So if you didn't already know, my husband and I, we don't do this full time. Christopher and I both have full time jobs outside of working on our garden and homestead. So it was a lot of effort last year to get things going. I wanna say I spent most of my time just weeding the garden. Uh, fortunately, we, well, I'd, I say fortunately, but there are also some downsides, but we got a lot of rain last year. It rained almost every single day during the summer, and when it wasn't raining, it was cloudy and cold, and that was great for establishing some of our seedlings and, and plants that we had started from seed, uh, but it was definitely a challenge for other things. Um, we dealt with a lot of powdery mildew and different fungal diseases in our garden. Um, so good and bad. <laughs> the, the rain was good and bad. So here we are entering a new year and I'm really excited to see what the season has in store for us. Most of the garden expansion that we did last year, that's, that's going to be it for a while. We might add maybe a couple more small plots, but the garden is about at the size that I want it to be. Uh, at a size that I feel is manageable for two people. So I think that this year will be all about maintaining the gardens. So first off, if you're hoping to have a low maintenance garden like what I'm trying to achieve here, perennials are a must. So we planted a number of perennials last year. Uh, and before I get into what I planted, I wanna talk a little bit about why we plant perennials. So the great thing about perennials is you usually only have to plant them once and that saves you a lot of time and money in the spring. Now you might have to, you know, after a few years, collect seed to plant more perennials, but generally they grow well on their own. They're easy to maintain. A lot of them are quite pest resistant. So once you've planted them for the first time and put in the effort to establish a perennial garden, it will usually maintain itself with very little um, intervention. So perennials can be fruiting trees like apples, pears, uh, or fruiting bushes like blueberries, raspberry, you name it. But perennials can also be things like culinary and medicinal herbs. So I'm gonna share with you a huge list of the perennials that we planted last year. And unfortunately, I can't remember it all off the top of my head, so I did bring my laptop to help keep track of my notes. So last year, we planted sage, English thyme, lavender, yarrow, mullein, Chinese skullcap, two different varieties of echinacea. So echinacea purpurea, which is the most common one that you'll see in um, flower gardens, and echinacea, I believe it's angustifolia or augustifolia. I'll have to double check that. Uh, red clover, lemon balm, multiple varieties of mint, chocolate mint, sweet mint, mojito mint. Uh, we also planted self-heal, catnip, dandelion, and yes, I did say dandelion. We are growing dandelion both for the, the flower, the leaves, and the root, which all have amazing medicinal properties. If you're interested in learning more about what dandelion can be used for, I highly recommend that you watch this video here. We also have St. John's wort, marshmallow root, pleurisy root, wild rose, and plantain. So like I said, it was a huge effort last year trying to keep the weeds down while a lot of these perennials established, but now that they are established, I am so looking forward to the spring to see just how well they did. This will be the first year that the echinacea I planted blooms. So I'm just, I'm very excited to see the beautiful echinacea flowers blooming in the field, as well as a few other uh, flowering plants. 
So this year we will be adding just a few more perennial plants. Uh, I recently bought some Greek oregano for um, adding to our culinary herb garden. And this is Hardy Zones 4 through 9. I also bought some, let's see, common valerian. So valerian is a medicinal herb. We're going to add this to our medicinal herb garden. And it's used for treating things like insomnia, depression, anxiety, premenstrual syndrome. There's a lot of things that valerian can be used for. So I'm excited to add this to my collection of medicinal herbs. And this is a perennial that is hardy in zones three through nine. And finally, for our food forest, I have what is called the husk cherry. So I first learned about husk cherries from another Maine-based YouTube channel. Um, she's changed her channel once, and so I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it's That Hippie Chick Maine, uh, That Hippie Chick Off Grid Maine. I'll, I'll link it in the description below. So this particular variety of husk cherry, and it is called Vesalis pruinosa, Vesalis philid. Oh, there's two scientific names here. I wonder why that is. Have to look that up. So husk cherries are members of the tomato family. They are a sweet tomatillo that has a papery husk around it. Um, so you can eat the fruit, but every other part of the plant is toxic. So just something to keep in mind if you do decide to grow these. But I had the opportunity to try some of the fruit at the Common Ground Fair last fall and they are so sweet. They taste amazing. They kind of taste like just a fruit rather than a vegetable. Um, they don't taste like tomatoes at all, definitely say that. And I would just love to have this plant growing on the property so that I can just pick them and eat them as I want, kind of like you would do with um, sweet peas or just berries growing on a bush. Just something to snack on that's always readily available. So this is my first time growing husk cherries and I'll be growing them from seed. So I will let you know how that goes this year. So for our main vegetable garden, we will be growing our usual favorites. So that includes green beans, carrots, butternut squash, acorn squash, sweet peas, sweet corn, um, a variety of potatoes that we always grow red and russet potatoes, uh, and leeks, onions, shallots, chard, and kale. So I've been trying to grow cabbages on the property for quite a while and a, a number of different things that are members of the cabbage family. So um, just your standard cabbage, Brussels sprouts, um, broccoli is another one I've been trying to grow here. Uh, unfortunately, we do have a huge problem with cabbage moth, slugs and snails on the property and all of those pests love <laughs> members of the cabbage family. So I've tried a number of different things to try to protect my brassicas. Uh, I've tried diatomaceous earth, I've tried beer traps for the slugs and the snails, and I've also built um, netting around my plants to try to protect them. Um, but it always seemed like things were getting in, so if you have any suggestions for how to protect my cabbages in Maine, please share in the comments below. I am just desperate to be able to grow my own cabbages and make sauerkraut, so any help would be appreciated. Oh yes, we are also adding pie pumpkins this year. Previously, I had some decorative gourds in the house that I, as an experiment, cut up into pieces and threw into the bare spots in our field, and we ended up with a nice gourd pumpkin patch. Um, we have been eating those, but I wouldn't recommend it. They're extremely tough to cut open, um, and I have almost cut myself a few times just trying to break through the flesh. Um, and after doing that, I realized that it was probably best to grow pumpkins that were made for eating rather than the, the edible gourds. Now, let's talk about where I get my seeds. So I'm not against just going to a box store like Walmart and if something piques my interest, I'll, I'll buy it. Um, though as time has gone on, I have started using more re reputable seed dealers. So one of my favorite brands is Johnny's Selected Seeds. And the reason I like Johnny's is they are a Maine-based company. They started in Central Maine about 50 years ago, and they are employee-owned. 
So I know that the seeds I get there and the things that they recommend I grow in my area, I know they have years of experience growing in Maine and growing in Maine soils. Uh, and I also just like that they're an employee owned company. So I feel like anytime I buy seeds, I am supporting other Mainers. I do get most of my vegetable seeds from Johnny Seeds. I will occasionally get herbs, but if I'm looking for something that is more medicinal or more rare, I do try to get my seeds from another company called Strictly Medicinal Seeds. So Strictly Medicinal Seeds was a company that was recommended to me by one of my YouTube subscribers. And I ended up buying some seeds from them last year. I got Echinacea angustifolia, some pleurisy root and Chinese skullcap and all except the echinacea did really well last year and I think the echinacea did poorly not because they were poor quality seeds but just because I planted them too early and messed up a few things uh, during the planting process. I will link both Johnny seeds and Strictly Medicinal seeds in the description of this video if you're interested in checking those out. So like I said previously, you don't need to keep buying perennial seeds once your plants are established, as long as you're growing them in the right zone and they're not dying out over the winter. So that's one place that I do save quite a lot of money. When you're buying seeds, especially annuals, if you're planning to seed save, I would highly recommend that you avoid any F1 variety seed. So an example of an F1 variety seed is peppermint Swiss chard. Peppermint Swiss chard is this absolutely gorgeous version of chard that has a peppermint pink stem and I love planting it in my garden just because it just it looks so beautiful and it tastes great uh, but if you try to save seed from that plant those seeds that you grow are going to end up most likely reverting back to an original version of Swiss chard so if you're trying to make sure the seed that you save is going to result in the same plant year after year you want to avoid F1 varieties so there are lots of plants that you can easily seed save from. I have my collection of seeds right here. Um, I seed save green beans, summer squash, sweet peas, sweet corn, butternut squash, any of the squashes and beans and corn, very easy to seed save from. But you can also seed save from things like leeks and onions. They have very similar seed heads, so just make sure you label your seeds uh, so you don't get them mixed up. But once you start practicing seed saving, it saves you so much money and you get so many more seeds than you would get in a single packet. Um, so what I wanna talk about now is how I store and organize my seeds. So I like to use these, they're kind of like bead organizing trays. You can buy them at any craft store. And I've been using these for my larger seeds, uh, like the ones I mentioned before, the green beans and the sweet peas. Um, not everything is well labeled here, but I at least I know what's in here. I also use another bead organizing tool for my smaller seeds. So this has been incredibly useful. Many little containers in here, and they kind of look like Tic Tac tic-tac boxes and those will have the corresponding numbers. So I have lots that are labeled one and those represent all of my calendula seeds. And as you can see, these seeds are much smaller than the ones you see for my beans and corn. Uh, and this system works really well for me. I'm hoping over the years to learn about how to collect more seeds from some of the smaller, more complicated plants. Uh, and really build up a, a big seed library of all of the things that grow well on, on my property. And, um, you know, over the years, maybe come up with my own heritage varieties. I also seed saved from our barley this year. So I had ordered last year um, from a company called, they're called Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, but their website is I think rareseeds.com and they have this variety of purple barley that I was super interested in trying to grow here and um, we bought I want to say th four packets that each had 200 barley seeds so it was a small number it was a very small plot that we were starting but I made sure to save all of the seeds and we have about eight times the amount of seeds now eight to ten times uh, and so we'll just keep planting this until we have a giant field of purple karma barley. 
So that's where I get my seeds and how I seed save. And I'm always trying to learn how to seed save for more plants every year. So now let's just talk a little bit about what the overall garden plan is this year. So like I said before, we did most of our expansion last year and this year is going to be focusing on maintaining the gardens that we've built instead of adding more to it. I think it's about at the size that I can maintain it and my cats are playing under the table. Hi, Chucky, come here. Leave your sister alone. Chucky, Chucky, stop. Chucky, move along. So originally when I started this garden, I had very big lofty dreams. I wanted to start a, a CSA, which is uh, called Community Shared Agriculture, and I wanted to sell my produce. I also wanted to sell medicinal herbs from my garden and make different herbal teas. And we are still working towards that goal. There's a lot more infrastructure that's required for that than we were prepared for. Um, so what we are focusing on now is just providing more self-sufficiency for our home. Our goal is to eventually produce like 95% of the vegetables that we eat throughout the year and preserve enough outside of the growing season. So this year we will be growing tons more potatoes, carrots, onions, leeks. Um, the garden is still, the soil is still very virgin. Um, so we'll have to do a lot more this year with fertilizing, um, bringing in probably some imported uh, compost. Uh, we just don't have enough that we're producing on the property right now. And working on building infrastructure. So one thing that I struggled with last year, um, I have what's called a three sisters garden, which is a combination of corn, peas or beans, and squash. And in previous years, it did fantastic. But last year, it was also doing great. But some animals were getting in and eating my corn. I would go out there every morning and find that a new corn cob had been ripped off the stalk and there was just like this little trail of half-eaten corn cobs. Well, Chucky, it looks like something managed to get the tuna can out without setting off the trap. And... It's been helping itself to our sweet corn. I wonder where it could live. All the way to what I suspect was either a skunk or a raccoon den, um, but we definitely need to start doing more with fencing and protecting our garden from certain critters. Uh, we also saw a lot more deer in our garden and those went to town on our canola fields which we didn't mind as much because we were just using it as a cover crop, but I can see eventually the deer will start moving in and eating other plants like our kale and Swiss chard. Another thing that we're doing this year that's not garden related, but it's definitely going to take up a lot of our time. Uh, my stepson is turning 19 years old in February, and we've decided we're going to help him build a tiny house on the property so that he can live rent free. That's something he and my husband are gonna be working on for most of the summer. Uh, we've got a little plot planned out for him that is just to the right of the garden and it's in a forested area, so we'll have to do some clearing. And I suspect that that's gonna be taking up most of my husband's time while I'll spend most of my time um, in the garden, maintaining it and harvesting crops. So that's my 2024 garden plan. If you're interested in seeing what we had planned in previous years, I definitely recommend checking out this video here. In that video, I share how I kind of do the drawing and layout for my garden plan. And I go a bit more in depth about the medicinal plants that we planted that year and what their uses are. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. In just a few months, it's gonna be maple syruping season. So I suspect to see you very soon.